So finally I'm talking about this film. I'll say it's Akira Kurosawa's liked but still very underrated samurai epic, Kagamusha. Also big shout out to Major Jackson from my discord, he's been wanting me to do this one for a while so it's finally here. So I've almost reviewed all of Kurosawa's samurai films, I've kind of wanted to just get those over with first before I get to other ones that no one really knows about. And I'll say every one of his films is worth talking about just because he's the guy that is pretty much responsible for bringing this genre to the West. He might even be responsible for the genre itself. But I'll say every single one is just great. And just at the age of 70, he made an epic that just dared to question the meaning of the samurai code. Or even just the human code. And it's all... A story that's told through one individual. Kagemusha is the story of one such man. It's about a common thief who because of just his crazy resemblance to the warlord Shingen, he is chosen as Lord Shingen's double. So before I get into the story, just what I find interesting about the film is just the amount of history that's all put into the story. This is really a historical drama, and yes I know everything in this isn't accurate, but just the amount of historical detail and characters is pretty fascinating. When I first saw this film, I honestly knew nothing about Japanese history, so I kind of just viewed it as a fictional medieval story, but now years later I actually know stuff about Japanese history. This is mostly because of my fellow YouTubers, the Shogunate, also Sengoku Studies. Great channels, check them out. But it feels like a different film when I watch it now, it's weird. So the story follows the warlord Shingen, and this is after he's injured in battle. And because of this, the Takada clan is secretly trying to replace him with a double. And they're doing this in secret so that the enemy doesn't find out that their warlord Shingen isn't really in command. And this all takes place during three years with which the thief who's now being treated by everyone as if he were the real Shingen. But only the closest advisors know the truth. It is important to know that both friends and enemies do believe that Shingen is alive. His appearance or shadow creates both the respect of his clan and the caution of his enemies. If he's found out, then he's useless as Shingen's double. And what's kind of crazy is he can send hundreds of men to be killed. Even his own guards are going to willingly sacrifice their lives for him. But as himself, he's really pretty worthless. So it creates this really interesting dynamic of just trying to become someone that you're not. But the question is, what's Kurosawa saying with this film? And I think that the answer can be found in just the difference between the two kind of scenes that you get. His film contains both epic battle scenes of just incredible beauty and scale. And then there's the more smaller intimate scenes. <laughs> and they take place everywhere else. The drone room, the bedroom, the castles, the battlefield camps. The great battle scenes pretty much glorify the samurai system. Armies of thousands of men just drill themselves at death. And it's mostly for the sake of pride. But the smaller intimate scenes challenge that tradition. Everyone just nervously holds their breath when Shingen's double is tested. And this is with meetings, especially with his son, his mistresses, and even his horse. 
They're the hardest to trick because they know him more than anyone else. If they aren't fooled, then all this was really for nothing. All the displays and battlefield courage is all meaningless. Because the Takada clan has lost their leader who is basically their figurehead. The illusion that he exists creates the clan's reality. And I like how there's a real significance to the role of the Shadow. At first he doesn't really care, but then something in him changes. And I really like that about his character. There's a lot going on. And eventually he takes this job really serious. Eventually it becomes bigger than himself and he sees that. It's worth noting that Kurosawa made this film after a decade of personal hardship. This film was very much the promised land that he was fighting to get to, and it wasn't easy. And even though he's often considered to be the greatest living Japanese director, for some reason he was still unable to find financial backing in Japan, especially when he first tried to do the film. So first he tried to make a smaller film titled Dodez Kaden. It was a massive flop. He then tried to commit suicide, but he failed. He was eventually backed by the Soviet Union, so he went to Siberia where he filmed just the beautiful Dersu Uzala. Captain! Dersu! But Kagamusha still remained his obsession. And he was finally able to make it and this was with Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas. They helped them find US funding. The film he finally made, I'll say, is simple, it's bold, and it's colorful. But that's only on the surface. The film itself is actually quite deep. Kurosawa seems to be saying that with great human adventures, in this case samurai battles, they depend mostly on large numbers of men sharing the same fantasies or beliefs. He seems to be saying that it's unimportant whether or not the beliefs are based on reality. All that really matters is that men accept them. But when a belief is destroyed, the result is confusion, destruction, and death. And for example, at the very end of the film, and this is sort of a spoiler, but when the son of the real Lord Shingen orders his troops into a suicidal charge, and their deaths are not only unnecessary, but they're also meaningless, this is because they are not really on the behalf of the sacred person of the Warlord. And no Kurosawa review would be complete without just gushing about the visuals. And this film really doesn't disappoint in that respect. Just the pure amount of color, it's incredible. This very much is a portrait come to life. It's incredible how Kurosawa was even able to get just a shot on the ridge with the army just walking in front of the incredible sunset. It's one of my favorite shots in any film. And really the sunsets in this film are pretty incredible. Some of them are even red. It's amazing that he was able to just capture those moments. What's impressive too is this was before, you know, you could kind of artificially edit colors in films. So everything you see really is legit. But probably the standout visual moment in the film it has to be the dream sequence. And this really just has to be seen to be believed. I think it's one of the most visually striking scenes in film. In fact, I think this is one of the most beautiful films ever made. It rivals even Ron. What's interesting too about this film is that originally it was supposed to be led by the Zatoichi star Shinteru Katsu. 
And when you watch it, you could kind of see him playing a sort of goofy character. Because Katsu really is more on the comedic side. But apparently, the reason he wasn't in it is because he pissed off Kurosawa. And he did this by when they were trying to film, he kept walking in with his entire posse just taking pictures of him. This was because he was one of Japan's biggest stars at the time. So I guess he kind of had a big ego. But this pissed off Kurosawa and he replaced him with Tatsuya Nakadai. But I do think that Nakadai does do a good job with this character. But you could kind of see how this part was just intended for someone else. Nakadai doesn't really pull off the more comedic side. I think that definitely would have fitted Katsu's character more. But I will say that he still does an excellent job at playing the other two characters. And you gotta hand it to him, he's playing three characters in one film. And I really love the opening shot with the three Nakadais. It has all three characters sitting around and they're kind of talking to each other. But an interesting aspect that my friend Major Jackson brought up was how two of these characters along with the thief are actually the shadows of the daimyo. So it kind of makes you think when you watch a film. It's sad knowing that Toshiro Mifune was very suitable for the lead role. After all, he was the same age of this character. Actually, people close to Kurosawa recommended Mifune, but Kurosawa was still pissed at him for doing the Shogun show. At the time, there was a big thing with if you did TV, it was kind of an insult to people who made movies. So it kind of seemed like Kurosawa was very picky with who he wanted in his films. I also really like the depiction of Nobunaga in this. I think it's very realistic to how he behaved and his mannerism. It shows sort of his restless nature. He can't sit still, he needs to ride his horse around in circles. I also like how it shows how he was very open to the Christian Jesuits. In one scene, you could even see him accepting one of their blessings. Amen! Nobunaga was actually very open to the Western world, and he did like getting stuff from them. In fact, he kept many chests just filled with stuff that he collected. He seemed to admire the Jesuits for their tenacity and just traveling all the way to Japan just to spread their religion and just for living simple lives and this was different from some of the corrupted Buddhists of the time that sort of broke some of their religious teachings and interfered with politics. But one thing that's kind of funny and also kind of stupid and it's something I think about every time I see the film. And it's the scene where Nobunaga requests his horse. And for some reason, you know, just me and my stupid humor, I always think that his horse is going to be his page and he's just going to pretend to ride him like a horse. Ah! Yeah, it's stupid, I know. And maybe one day they can make like a Kung Pao of this movie, you know, edit it that way. But also just judging by his page's haircut, I think Kurosawa is implying that it was actually his wakashu. And you know, you can look up what that is, I don't really want to go into detail with that. But maybe him riding him like a horse isn't really too far from the truth. Mm. Birdie. There's just a ton of great images in this film, but the final image of this film is something else. And again, this is a spoiler. I do warn you if you haven't seen it yet, and I'll try to be vague. It's of the dying man floating in the sea, and he's being swept by the currents past this fallen flag of the Takada clan. And that shot alone just summarizes everything. Men and purpose are carried along heedlessly by the currents of time. And historical meaning seems to appear when both happen to be swept in the same way at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
This film's often labeled as just being the dress rehearsal for Ron. I think even Kurosawa called it that. But I kind of disagree with that. I think it very much is its own film. And it's a great film. I've heard some people complain that it's boring and too long. But I feel like if you're bored watching this, then obviously you don't even like this genre to begin with. So I don't even consider that a criticism. But I also feel like those people just like to complain about anything that isn't all action all the time. I feel like I get more entertainment out of this than any action film. And maybe it's because I could tell this film was hard to make. You know, it's very big in scale. There's incredible images, the colors, the tragic story. Kind of a deep story once you kind of think about it. There's honestly a lot I could talk about with this film. You know, maybe one day I'll do another video just revisiting it. I'm sure there's other topics. So anyway, if you want to watch a film or own it, it's widely available. I own the Criterion Blu-ray, still weighing on that 4K. You could also stream it on Amazon or YouTube, but I recommend just getting the best quality possible. Hopefully one day they could bring this back to the movies, I'd love to see it on the big screen. Anyway, thanks for watching, please subscribe, support me on Patreon, and like always, thanks for watching. Thank <music> you.